Hey guys, so we just got off uh, an amazing interview with Drew Manning, uh, a friend of ours that we've got a chance to connect with on a f- quite a few podcasts now. And we've, we've touched base with him on various aspects during his journey. Um, he recently just finished his Fit to Fat to Fit 40, where he's gone through this journey of gaining a whole bunch of weight and then dropping it um, after a number of months. And we talked about the testing that he did and just the, the emotional challenges and goal setting. Um, we talked about a number of amazing, important things. And what I love that he brings up is that emotional, hormonal piece and that bigger picture and that relationship with food and ourselves. Because a lot of times we can get stuck on the numbers, right? What we want to lose weight or we want to look a certain way, but he's really bringing awareness to the fact that this journey is going to be reflective of your journey in many aspects of your life. So have a listen. It's a really good podcast. It's very relatable. And I'm sure you're going to find some tidbits in there that you can incorporate into your life today. Yeah, we recommend uh, maybe even as a prerequisite, go back and listen to the first one that we did with Drew, uh, where he was actually in a relationship. And we talked a little bit about the journey out of that relationship in this particular one. So it's it's a fascinating look at, um, you know, self-love, but also that interrelationship uh, that happens with uh, food addiction or, or lifestyle habits and everything else. So make sure you tune in that one as well. So enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited, uh, here with my lovely wife, Dr. Sonia. Uh, we had a nice day today, actually. We went for a little forest run and mm-hmm. got a chance to spend our, spend walk. some time outside. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It was a walk run. Walk run. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we run when the temperature is a little bit colder, your yeah. ears just, no, they just do they, funny they things. They don't like it. Um, yeah. I need to be in the heat. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like so Hawaii. Having, yeah. Hawaii. Yeah, no Hawaii, that's right. <laughs> Speaking of Hawaii, uh, we're back with another conversation with Drew Manning, who just finished his Fit to Fat to Fit 40. Um, and we're going to have a chat with Drew today, uh, again, just to, to recap on everything that he's been through and, and lots to come. So, Drew, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's always good talking to you guys. It's, I wish we were closer, you know, (laughs) but, um, yeah, yeah, one day meet me out there. Seriously, I'll show you guys around. (laughs) Um, when was the last time I was on? Was it no, was it when I was at my heaviest? No, no, it was before I started. Oh, okay. No, no, you you had already started, but you were just in the beginning stages. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So a lot has happened since then. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Well, let's, let's kind of talk a little bit about that. We, we got permission from you beforehand just to make sure we could talk a little bit about some of the emotional challenges that showed up during your time. And last time we spoke, you were actually in, in relationship and we talked a little bit about the dynamic of, um, you know, having these relationship expectations as you're, you know, basically educating, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world about what it means to go through these massive physiological changes and what that means from a, you know, emotional point of view. So um, in this journey, it was, it was quite a bit different for you, but we'd love to hear just some of the emotional ups and downs uh, going in and out of, uh, you know, the relationship, but also just your relationship with food and what that looked like for you. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's interesting going into this journey, this, my second fit to fat to fit experiment, I kind of went into it a little bit cocky thinking, Oh, I, I got this. I've done this before. Like I know what to expect. It's not going to be that hard. Like, you know, kind of thinking I, I got this. Um, once again, I was truly humbled, just like the first experiment. I didn't think it was going to be that difficult and I was truly humbled and it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Fast forward to, you know, this one almost 10 years later, doing it again a second time as a 40 year old in a different place in my life. Cause back then I was married, had, you know, two young kids, you know, went through a divorce about five years later and, you know, I'm a single dad. And then this, the dynamic was different this time around. Cause I was in a relationship with a girlfriend that we'd been together for about two years. And we, we joked about like, Oh, you're going to, I'll make you sign a contract. So you can't break up with me when I'm, <laughs> you know, overweight. Um, and then, you know, life happens, life sometimes happens and, you know, I, neither of us expected to end up in a breakup in the middle of this journey, but it totally switched the dynamic of this whole journey because in the beginning of the journey, I was eating the food cause it tasted good, but also to gain the weight, right? Like this is what I do fit to fat to fit, put on a lot of weight in a short amount of time to better re- relate to my clients. And yes, there was times where I was eating the food to just like, cause it tasted good and I needed to gain the weight, right? Fast forward to about November, um, going through a breakup, which is not easy. I don't care who you are. I don't wish that on anyone. It's so hard emotionally, spiritually. And here I was at my unhealthiest. It wasn't just the fact that I was overweight. It was being unhealthy. And what I mean by that is my sleep was off. 
right? My hormones were off. So I wasn't the same version of myself. And then the food switched. And now instead of eating the food to gain the weight, I was eating the food to numb the emotional pain I was going through. Mm. I was sad. I was lonely. I was depressed. This is probably one of the hardest things I've ever been through, even harder than my divorce, because it was like, all of a sudden it happened. And it was in the middle of a, a journey where I was in the public eye and, and I had to address it. You can't just like pretend it didn't happen. People were asking questions. And so I had to address it. And that's what was so hard was in those moments of feeling sad and lonely and depressed, there's something about eating ice cream or cake or chocolate or wine or alcohol, something that gives you this little dopamine hit that temporarily numbs the pain. In the long run, you feel like crap later, but in the short term, I see why people emotionally eat because food is the easiest drug to turn towards because it's not like crack cocaine or heroin where you have to go find it. It's everywhere. And you get the same kind of you know chemical reaction in your brain where you're eating this Ben and Jerry's Netflix and chilled ice cream, which is amazing by the way. And <laughs> <laughs> you're sad, you're crying. And like, it's this temporary relief from that emotional pain. And so I'm not condoning the behavior, but I understand on a deeper level now, having been through this, why people gravitate towards food as their emotional drug of choice, because it's so accessible. It's so affordable. It tastes so amazing. And yes, you get these little dopamine hits multiple times a day if you want to, to take away numb uh, and distract you from the pain that you're feeling that life sometimes throws at you. And that's why this challenge, this fit to fat to 40 experiment was 10 times harder than my first experiment uh, because of this emotional pain going through it. And now I can empathize with people so much more on a deeper level, why people get stuck in that vicious cycle. Because what happens is the emotions of life don't go away. Stresses of life don't go away. No matter how much you try and willpower your way to a new lifestyle, like, okay, I'm never eating sugar again. I'm never drinking alcohol again. Guess what? There's going to be a moment in time where life is going to throw a wrench in it and you're going to be stressed out. And now you've programmed your brain to reach for easy substances like food or alcohol or drugs or whatever the, the drug choice is for the person to distract yourself from that. And now your brain's like, oh, I'm in pain. Okay, there's the ice cream. There's the chocolate. There's the wine. Like we do this to ourselves. And then to just willpower your way out of it isn't that easy because now you're emotionally attached to it. And that's what no one really talks about in the fitness industry. It's just like, oh, just eat less of that and eat more you know, healthy food and you'll be fine. It's like, okay, well, if, if it were that simple, everyone would be healthy and fit. But um, there's this emotional connection to food that's more powerful than people think. Mm -hmm. on, on that note, I, I can't help but think you guys, you guys broke up during a time when you were obviously gaining weight and you were relating to food a little bit differently through the, this emotional body. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, how did you see yourself in that, in that time? Did you see yourself as fit drew going through a rocky relationship or did you actually mm -hmm. identify with the weight gain and going maybe more self deprecating sort of thoughts because of the, the biochemistry, because of how you looked? Like, I'm curious if you had a, a moment of like, holy crap, I'm going through this as who I am right now, or am I going through this through the Drew that knows that I'm going to get back to normal, everything's going to be cool in a few months? Uh, yeah, you know that's, a mean? deep, that's a deep yeah. question. That's really hard to answer because I think, I feel like it was a mix of both because yeah. no matter how much I tried to use the tools I've learned over the years of self-awareness and being present in the moment and, and you know, meditating and, and, and being able to observe my thoughts rather than attach myself to my thoughts, Yes, that part of me was present in these moments, but also there's something to say about, I don't care how woke you are, if you're sleep deprived and your hormones are off, your testosterone is low, your emotions are high, your, your stress hormones are through the roof, like that part of you does control your emotional response right. to stressful situations. So like my ability to handle stress was severely diminished because of the physical state that I was in. And so I don't care who you are, like I said, the most woke person in the world, when you like multiple nights in a row of sleep deprivation and not sleeping through the night, your HRV is low, your cortisol is through the roof, like your ability to handle stress is not what it, what you think it is. And so a lot of people ask me, like, did you break up because of this journey? My response is no, we had problems before this, this journey, I think just manifested those problems exponentially more than they would have been had I been, you know, physically healthy, but because I was unhealthy, those problems became like 10 X what they normally were because probably because yeah, my ability to handle stress isn't what it was, but 
it's not like all of a sudden we had these problems like that we've never had before. It's just those problems were amplified by the fact that I was super unhealthy. And this is what I try to get across to people is like you, your physical health affects your emotional response to your relationships in life, to everything. And so if you think eating the cinnamon toast crunch and drinking three beers before bed doesn't affect you as a husband, as a, as a wife, as a mom or dad, you're wrong. You're missing the point. Like you're missing how powerful these substances are when it comes to your relationships and they do affect how you respond and, and how you, um, how you present yourself in these situations. And it was even more powerful for me. And so that's kind of what the educational part of this journey was, even though I had to go through this hell to kind of learn that lesson. But my hope is that people could maybe see themselves in this journey a little bit, like, man, maybe I'm not as good of a spouse when I'm drinking every night and I'm eating, you know, junk food. I'm not treating my body kindly. Like uh, maybe it affects my relationships more than I, more than I think. And that's, I think that's very true for most people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially in a world with, with COVID right now and the amount of people that are mm-hmm. under stress. You know, under stress. Yeah. Go ahead. And I think it becomes kind of a cyclical effect. You know, um, sometimes maybe the beginning state really is not knowing how to respond to stress because we have a certain belief system or we've been navigating stresses in a certain way. So that creates a physiological response in itself. And then you combine it with the external environment, with the foods we're eating, the way we're moving or how we're sleeping. And it just all kind of works together to create this new pattern to help you really essentially your body is doing whatever it can to just help you survive instead of thrive in all of your moments. So as you were talking, I was kind of curious because, you know, I think you said some real truth in there because even with us, like we eat well, we move, we do all the right things. Right. And then stress happens. I mean, this past year has definitely been a challenge for me and my go-to usually is depression. And I know Mm -hmm. for me, if I eat too much wheat, Last week, we had a family <laughs> wedding, right? There was too many Indian treats and things there. And I was like, okay, this is a variation week. And I did it, but I could see that the brain fog was starting to show up. My mood mm-hmm. was starting to change. So if you have, did you reflect in that time that when you were healthy, because when you weren't healthy, food was the drug, yes. right? And I find, like, I'll just use myself as an example. I feel like I'm healthy. Food isn't my drug because I've you know, change my relationship to it. And I had to, because mm-hmm. I used to be anorexic. So I've changed that. But I feel like mine now is, is depression. Like mm-hmm. I will move into this state of wanting to hide from the world. So did yeah. you have any awarenesses of like, okay, right now food is my thing, but what's, what's, what's my thing when I'm mm-hmm. in this healthy state? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think luckily I was able to break free from that cycle because I, being aware of it is the first key, like aware, aware of the cycle that you're stuck in. So knowing that I, okay, once I start moving my body, like walking, exercising, meditating, journaling, like getting back to like the things that I normally do, I kind of had to have faith in that process of being able to help me through that because, you know, you know, you guys know the studies of exercise versus antidepressant drugs and how powerful exercise is for an antidepressant. And, and I just kind of had to have faith that, Hey, yes, I'm going through hell right now. And I'm going to keep going through hell with this Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Cause yeah, it temporarily feels good, but I know this isn't the long-term fix for this situation. So knowing that at some point moving my body, uh, you know, some type of physical exercise is going to be therapeutic for processing, you know, the, the stress, the emotional pain that I'm going through. Um, I kind of had to have faith in that, that I knew that 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 was going to help. So what does it look like in a healthy world? Yes. It's me exercising, me being disciplined with meditation, cold showers, gratitude journal, positive affirmations. And yes, there was some times when I was doing that, like, yeah, in my unhealthy state, but I kind of compare it to like, you know, pouring a bucket of water on a burning building and expecting that to help, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, those things do help out a little bit, but the whole the whole building's on fire. It's not going to really do a whole lot until you get everything in place. And so, um, and it's interesting because I, I did, uh, when I transitioned to eating healthy food again, uh, and exercising again, there was about a two week period where it, it wasn't really helpful just yet. And this is what I try and help people understand is like just eating your first salad isn't going to make you lose all the weight, nor are you going to feel healthy. You're actually probably going to feel worse because your body is so used to the high that it had the past like X amount of months you've been eating this way. And this is why people struggle with transitioning into a healthy lifestyle is because at first they don't feel that great. At first they're like, your body's like, what are you doing? Give us this junk food that we want. You know, like we want that high, you know, and it takes a while to break that 
that, that dependency, that cycle, just like a drug addict would go through withdrawal symptoms before they, you know, are cleared. So it's a very similar situation, but after two weeks of like being consistent and just trusting the process, it's amazing how, how powerful that stuff is, you know, exercise, eating healthy, you know, managing your, your stress, sleeping, um, you know, efficiently throughout the night. It's amazing how powerful that stuff is when it comes to your overall well-being. Mm-hmm. On that note, um, I'd love to jump into goal setting. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of us get stuck in our, in our preference instead of <laughs> being anchored in our presence and the journey and whatnot. Um, has goal setting or goal accomplishment, I mean, because you've done some pretty awesome stuff, like the 100 mile, mar- oh, was a 100 mile mm-hmm. marathon. You've done some pretty amazing things. I mean, this, this what you just went through, <laughs> again, it's another marathon too. But how, how do you relate to goals now? And wh- what does that look like for you as you anchor into things that come up in the future? Yeah, I think goals are, are necessary for almost, you know, the entire population. But I think the way we perceive our goals is, is what the problem that most people have is because people put these goals in place and like, okay, I want to lose X amount of pounds. And the problem with that is a lot of those things are outside of your control. Like you could eat healthy, you could count calories and macros and sleep and exercise and all that stuff. But to be honest with you, we don't really control the number that shows up on the scale. Like you could do all those things, but you really don't have that control over that for the most part, right? You guys understand what I'm saying? Like, Mm -hmm. so when you set these goals where a lot of it depends on outside factors that you can't control, you're leaving a lot of it up to chance. And so it's like a 50, 50 chance of you actually hitting that number. I'm not saying setting that goal is wrong. I'm saying, okay, what other goals can you put in place where you are actually in control of? So instead of saying, I want to lose 20 pounds this month, it's like, okay, for the next month, I want to take a cold shower every single day. I want to, you know, eat three servings of vegetables and I want to exercise five days a week. And then from there, all those things are within your control and what shows up on the scale is like a, you know, a byproduct or like a cherry on top. If it moves down the, the way you want it to, then cool. But your goal is independent on these outside factors, you know, the stars aligning and hopefully boom, this magic number shows up that you want. Right. Um, and so uh, being aware of when you do set your goals, how much of those goals are in, in your control and how much of those goals are outside of your control. And like I said, I'm not saying you shouldn't set goals like that because it's good to push for those things. I think the other thing is, people don't plan for after reaching those goals. Like they're like, okay, what do I do now? (laughs) Like, you know, I reached my goal. Okay. I guess I'll go back to eating the way I was and go back to like my old lifestyle. Cause that's kind of like my homeostasis. That's where my body knows how to stay like um, fixed. Cause that's my comfort zone. People need to ask themselves. And then what? Cause a lot of people reach their goal, but then they don't know what to do. And so it's like, ah, I've lost motivation to reach that goal. And now, now what do I do? I can't lose. You can't just keep losing weight right? You can't, you know, you can't just keep going down in, in size until there's nothing left. So you have to ask yourself, and then what? And this is something I learned from David Goggins, even though his methods are kind of extreme for, for me or for even like your average person out there, it, it's important to always have something, you know, you're working towards because if there's no progress, if you're just working out to like, to look good, to have a six pack, that gets old really quickly. You know, if you're just working out to like uh, be skinny, that gets old really quickly. There's gotta be something bigger than that out there. So I'm totally fine with people, you know, pushing their limits, like maybe trying a hundred mile run. Like I did, like, I'm not saying everyone should do that, but whatever your hundred miles is, whether that's one mile or five miles or whether that's something that's out of your comfort zone, those are the kinds of things we need to maybe look at as goals because those things force us out of our comfort zone. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe going to Costa Rica and doing a, a breath work, workshop where you're like, okay, I've never done breath work or I've never done cold water therapy. Maybe that's something I'm going to try. And you're forced out of your comfort zone. And that's where you grow the most and be looking for things like that to do in your future so that you're not always like, okay, what am I going to do this year? Lose weight again. Okay. You know, and you kind of like, that's not as exciting. It's not as like motivating. You got to find something that's new, that's invigorating, that kind of like, you know, gets your fire going. And so that's kind of my Per, uh, my 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 two cents on setting goals mm-hmm. yeah it sounds like you're really trying to get them to anchor into the the bigger why and then from mm-hmm. there um, creating that variation so that there's more adversity in what they're doing so that there is something to look forward to and there's something to achieve instead of just doing the same thing over and over again and then the mind kind of gets bored of that too right yeah. so mm-hmm. i think it's just creating that variation is really important so do you have like steps to success 
for people? Mm -hmm. Like, are there, is there like a formula that you use that you can educate people on? Or is there somewhere that you think people can start with maybe identifying their intentions or their deeper why? So for example, when I work with somebody and they tell me, okay, I want more energy. And um, mm -hmm. my next question to them is, well, why do you want more energy? What is that going to allow you to do? Is that going to allow mm -hmm. you to travel? Is that going to allow you more time with your grandkids? Like, is there a formula that you give individuals when it comes to their fitness goals or life goals at all? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know if I have a formula necessarily, but I do like your approach of what you're saying. I think something that falls into that category of what I provide for people is defining what success is based on their perception. I think it, honestly, most of the time is helping people unlearn what they think success is and then reverse engineering it from there. You know, so like people are like success is being skinny, looking, you know, 5% body fat. Okay, cool. If your perception of that is, it, or if you think that is success, okay, why, why do you think that's, that's success to you? And kind of going into, you know, uh, how they've been programmed to think that's success and then learning how to unprogram that and realize that success has nothing to do with the results has everything to do with falling in love with the process. So what is the process that I have people do? Of course, they know they have to diet and exercise. So that's not the main focus. That's not the main goal that we, we focus on because that's something that they already know is going to be part of the process. What I have people do is this checklist of things that I've kind of sprinkled in the podcast so far, but a checklist of, of, of things that help them rewire their brain to redefine what success is. And so the first thing that I have people do is make their bed, take a cold shower, meditate, gratitude list, positive affirmations, and all these things that I'm listing have nothing to do with getting a six pack. They have zero to do with burning calories and losing weight, right? Like maybe a little bit in the, in the cold water or the cold shower, but you know, minimal, right? You're not going to get a six pack from doing that. All these things are doing are rewiring your brain to become comfortable in uncomfortable situations. And that's the key to a true lifestyle change is telling your body and your brain that, Hey, this is an uncomfortable situation, like a cold shower, that sucks. It's very uncomfortable. Meditating is very uncomfortable for a lot of Westerners because they're like, how do I sit here with my thoughts? That's so uncomfortable. And all you're doing is letting yourself know like, hey, this is something that maybe seems hard, but it's an uncomfortable situation. And guess what? You can train your brain in these moments to become comfortable so that when you do have to exercise, which is hard and uncomfortable and you're sweating and your muscles are burning, you tell yourself, hey, that we got this, we can do this. We've done this before in these other exercises and now it's gonna carry over into you know physical exercise, which isn't fun. Same thing with eating healthy food, which isn't always the tastiest food. And maybe sometimes you're a little bit hungrier than you normally are when you're eating junk food. Um, but you're reminding yourself, you're reminding your brain like, hey, this is what this training is for. It's helping me realize that I can be comfortable in these uncomfortable situations. And then guess what? Now that you're not even focused on the results, the results end up taking care of themselves over time as a byproduct because the process of everything we just mentioned becomes your main focus because you you realize, hey, I'm worth it to fight for these. Uh, for I'm worth it to feel good. I'm worth it to do this process because the process makes me feel good. Like eating healthy food, everyone's going to tell you, yeah, I feel better when I eat healthy food. I feel better when I sleep through the night. I feel better when I'm strong and I'm exercising consistently during the process of exercising, yeah, you don't, it doesn't feel the best, right? Like I get it. But if you can become comfortable in those uncomfortable situations, what I'm saying is you realize, man, I'm worth it to fight for my physical health, not to get the results in hopes that those results will make me happy because society tells me if you get these results, then you'll be happy. And we all know that's a myth. Like if everyone that had a six pack you know, was, was happy, it, then we'd be like, oh, there's something to that. But I promise you, there's a lot of miserable people with 5% body fat that still hate themselves. So it's not the results that equate to happiness. It's you realizing that you're worth it to fight for this process that maybe sometimes you perceive as this sucks or this is hard or this is suffering, but then you, your perception of it shifts and you're like, oh, this process actually makes me feel good about myself and I'm doing it because I love the way I feel doing this process. And then the results end up taking care of themselves over time. And then you realize it was never about the results. It was, it was never about getting to this, the top of the, the, the mountain or the finish line. And then the happiness comes is the happiness comes during the process. And this whole shift in perception, going back to goal setting is kind of what this whole thing is about is like reverse engineering or rewiring the brain of letting people know what success is and what success isn't and redefining that.
Does that make sense? Yeah, I love that you said that because it really ties in the, it ties it right back to goal setting. And I think so many of us, you know, get, like you said, get so stuck on, on the results and we, we forget that what we're doing is building resiliency and, and learning how to be okay with the challenge, uh, which yeah. so many of us, you know, we relate to, we've said this before, is as soon as we hear something's hard, it's just like the limbic system shuts down or, or <laughs> activates and goes, well, well screw way. this. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be hard. I'm not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> And we're just so wired for that. You know, I th think we talk about the amygdala and the other, the other aspects of brain health that, that mm -hmm. we are totally wired for protecting ourselves from danger. And it's, you know, whether it be taking away the treats we like or, mm -hmm. you know, sedentary lifestyle, like that's complacency. That's, that's our natural state. And to go against that natural state brings a, a whole whack load of challenges. And I feel like it starts at a young age because when, when we're watching our old, especially our oldest son, he has such a oh, challenging yeah. time transitioning. Right? Yeah, and I feel like yeah. so when that happens, then it was like we have to start tr training that brain mm -hmm. to be okay with the change and transition. And you know, we force some big transitions on them with like moving, yeah, uh, moving schools, and you know, putting in some uncomfortable. Me taking his cats away. That's hard. I don't want to do that again. A little bit of adversity <laughs> sprinkled on him. <laughs> yeah, that, with kids, yeah. it's so hard to actually apply it to them because you know it's better for them in the end, but in yeah. the moment, you're like, ah. Oh, this yeah. is hard. Uh, so I get it. Yeah. I think the other thing to say too is uh, not to interrupt, but like the, the perception of society is saying now like self-love is eating whatever you want, living an unhealthy lifestyle saying you can do that. And that's self-love. I think people confuse hard work with like, Oh, that's, that's discipline. That's uh, like, I don't like, that's not self-love when in reality doing those hard things in the end, it really, it truly is self-love because you're a better version of yourself. And then people get into this trap of like, oh, that's that's hard. I don't want to do that. Oh, this is easy. That's self-love. Like that feels like self-love. It's like mm -hmm. pizza and wine and chocolate and massages and never moving a muscle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think people yeah. sometimes with society nowadays are kind of gravitating towards that as self-love. It's yeah. in a celebrator, right? You know, we're, yeah. we, you know, thinking back to college or what have you, it was always so fun to talk about how stupid you got on the weekend or how much fun you had or like, how much you drank it becomes yeah. like this reward in this like wow like that person's having so much fun their life is so good you know it's it's that same kind of thinking that you know the the pizza the the beer the mm. alcohol the the drug becomes this wow factor that that we're sort of brainwashed into wanting and it's yeah. it's really challenging but, but i think the other element that drew's speaking to is in today's world you know there's there's so much that we can't speak to anymore yeah. because of the sensitivity around topics. Yeah. So when individuals, you know, maybe aren't in a healthy state, but they're spoken to as if, well, you just got to love yourself and be okay with that state. Mm. And yeah. that's okay. That's who you yeah. are. And there's de definitely elements of really accepting yourself, I think is really important, but then also loving yourself so much, like Drew was saying that I'm going to change this so that my health, is on par so I can experience life the way I really want to. So I think there's an, there is an interesting thing happening yeah. in our world yeah. today that's yeah. promoting like, that other lifestyle of like, okay, well, yeah, discipline doesn't work or commitment. It's mm -hmm. okay because you're loving yourself. So yeah. there's so, a fine line. Brittany mm -hmm. runs a marathon. I love like that show. movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you seen that, Drew? I have not. Oh, okay. It's all, it's all about learning that, that state of self-love, you know, that, that goal, I think initially, like a, a reason maybe why people go and exercise, you know, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to lose weight or, you know, yeah. that, that often is that instigation. It's, it's also like, you know, a reason for looking for a relationship. It's because you want to feel love. And then you eventually realize that you're actually loving yourself when you're with uh, that person who, you know, you're meant to be with. Um, so I think it's just this yeah. transformation. So on that, on that note of like, uh, you know, goal realization and whatnot, I mean, you did some testing before and after. Mm -hmm. So there's some goals that came up with looking at physiological changes, biochemical changes. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, before middle, and then uh, you just got some new blood work. So that stuff's not ready yet, but if you could talk about that. Journey. Yeah, I can talk about some of it. So like, you know, I wanted to make sure I have a doctor follow me on this journey to show people what's happening on the inside of my body. Right. And, uh, you know, so people get so fixated on like, oh, Drew's getting fat, like the outward appearance. But let's look at see what 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 happens to the inside of, of our bodies when we live this lifestyle. So my numbers, you know, my baseline numbers were really good. Like 
you know, you can't argue like my triglycerides, triglycerides were 46. HDL was 68. Um, you know, H and my LDL, you know, depending on who you ask was a little bit high 139, but like, I'm not, I'm not worried at all about that. <laughs> uh, C reactive protein of 0.21. Um, you know, my testosterone was like 600 plus, uh, to, you know, my, um, uh, let's see, my, my thyroid was all in the green. Everything was good, right? Baseline. Now, if you guys remember, I talked maybe on the last episode about doing an experiment with certain diets, keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and doing the dirty version of these diets, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I talked about the numbers we did, but I'll, maybe I'll just focus on one aspect of those numbers to kind of, because we don't have like hours to go through all this. <laughs> but um, so my, my baseline triglycerides were 46, right? You guys will agree that's a good number to start out with, right? Okay. After a month of eating junk food, it went up to 246, right? And then I did the diet experiment, right? Where I went dirty keto, dirty paleo, dirty vegan, dirty vegetarian. And I did my blend work uh, before and after each of those weeks, right? So my triglycerides, even on dirty keto, which was full of keto ice cream, keto cookies, butter, bacon, and cheese, like lots of cheese, lots of bacon, <laughs> you know, um, you know, lots of like, uh, you know, fast food without the bun, like, you, know, you guys know the dirty version of keto, right? Mm -hmm. Even with that, my triglycerides dropped to 79, right? Even eating wow. all those junk food. But then were, I you, were you measuring your ketones at the same time? I was and I was 0. 0.4 0. 0.5 most days okay. because I was still eating 5000 calories of keto foods, even though it was like dirty keto foods. I never really got high ketone levels, probably because of the just the, the quantity of food I was eating totally. and the hidden carbs, right. But um, so and then I did dirty paleo, which dirty paleo is kind of hard to do, actually, because paleo is focused on whole foods. So it mostly it was like paleo granola, paleo, paleo, um, you know, bars, lots of bars, lots of fruits, lots of fruit juices. Um, that's kind of what I focused on. And then my triglycerides went up to 172, right? So not, not horrible, but starting to elevate. Then I did dirty vegan, which includes Oreos and like lots of candies are vegan and lots of sodas are vegan and, you know, lots of breads and pasta, rice, cereal, all these foods that are, you know, vegan, it jumped up to, uh, 488. Wow. So after one, after one week of eating dirty vegan, and then it gets worse. I did dirty vegetarian, which is all those vegan foods I mentioned. And then like mac and cheese and bean and cheese burritos and, you know, lots of like, you know, sandwiches, you know, without meat, That's anything like without meat. Oh, right. That, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I, my triglycerides went up to 538. Wow. Um, in just one week, which is really, you know, scary how quickly your blood work can change. Um, and that's just one number, right? If we focus on every single number, that would take a while. But um, but what I wanted to show people is during this experiment, like just because you do keto or just because you are vegan or paleo or vegetarian, there's a right way and wrong way that people do these diets. And anytime you're doing these diets and you're gravitating towards comfort foods because you miss ice cream or you have to have a cookie or you have to have this treat or that treat, most people are gravitating toward these processed foods that fall into these categories that are marketed to them as like health foods. And you're, you can become very unhealthy and gain a lot of weight really quickly doing these diets. And, um, it was really interesting how, how those numbers changed, um, to make I'm a long story, your testosterone oh, too. Oh yeah. My testosterone got to the two hundreds <laughs> after four months of eating this way, which was expected. And I, I didn't even have to get the number tested to be able to tell you, cause I was like crying during commercials. I was like emotional all the time. I was, um, you know, low libido, low sex drive. Like it just wasn't there. And that's, you know, to be expected, but I wanted to help people see that correlation between, Hey, the foods you eat and like the alcohol you drink and the junk food you're doing, like, and, and, and how it affects your sleep, it's going to affect your hormones. And when your hormones are affected, you're not the same version of yourself. Like you don't, when you have low testosterone, your energy levels, your motivation, your, your sex drive, your libido, all these other things are factored into that. And it affects you in more ways than you think. And so I wanted people to understand that is like, Hey, you can't just pop a pill and just continue to drink soda and drink alcohol and eat junk food and expect the problem to be fixed. Especially if you're like 30 years old, 40 years old, ED, like there's natural ways. Like if you change your lifestyle, maybe let's start there instead of just popping a pill and hoping that fixes everything, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, testosterone so. is such an important one. I'm glad you brought that up because um, people don't really understand the impact that what you eat has on your testosterone and then on your fertility and then mm. on your grandchildren's um, health mm. as well. They've done studies where they've looked at grandfathers and their grandsons and how the grandfather's um, food intake and health and sperm count and all those things, testosterone related things affect the grandson. So you don't realize that what your the choices that you're making today are going to really decide your future, like the future generations. And with testosterone, there's like so many receptors in our brains so that mm -hmm. it's like it's a natural antidepressant. And most of the male hormone issues today are because of estrogen. So I think that relationship is really important too. Like you were saying, you were crying on commercials. It's because <laughs> that testosterone is getting converted into estrogen, right? And, and they're, get, yeah. they're getting better at making good commercials too, let's be honest. It could be the quality <laughs> of the commercials, you yeah. know, and I got something in my eye too. Yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, and, the, and then the other thing too, I mean, you know this, obviously, it's like as as insulin rises, because you're creating an insulin resistant state, insulin mm -hmm. and testosterone are inversely related to right. So um, did you did you do any insulin measurements as well? I did. And uh, yeah, so it was 1.1 to begin with, yeah. which is really good. And I got That's it to awesome. 20, 23 point two. Wow. And I got it tested again today. And I think it was like 2.3. So not not where it was when I started, but obviously very low. Yeah. But it, it tenfold it, it, it wow. increased, which is is scary. How could, just in four months of eating this way? And here's the interesting thing: a lot of the genetics plays into this, right? It really does. Like, had I lived this way for years or decades, there's going to be some issues. Like, I don't care who you are. Mm -hmm. The fact that I was healthy going into this and and have good family genetics on my side, you know, played a role into how how sick I got or how unhealthy I got. But it's scary how quickly the body can change even though i gained the fat like that's not what it's about it's about the health and how this food affects your health and that's why i wanted to do the blood work to really show people this is how quickly your body can change like developing a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver in four to six months is really scary and a lot of people like i know a lot of people eat saw the food i ate they're like no one eats like that it's like okay, well, then you're missing out on all the people that are in the hospital because there's a lot of people that eat this way day in and day out and they don't know any better and they just keep eating this food and they can't figure out why they're so sick all the time and then unhealthy. I would say 80% of the population eats this food because it's convenient, mm -hmm. it's affordable, it tastes freaking good, it's, it's designed to be hyper palatable and addictive and you gravitate, you, you go back to this food because it's, it's what you know. You know? And it's promoted, especially mm -hmm. in other countries. Like if you go to Mexico, Costa Rica, even Hawaii, when you go to like some of the stores there, um, some of the food that gets shipped to these places, it's just all junk food. And so the populations, maybe, you know, some places they can't afford different foods unless they're growing their own um, produce, which, you know, luckily most are, but depending on which area you're in, there's a lot of issues, health issues developing there because of all the shipment of junk food. Mm -hmm. that they're getting mm -hmm. so i think yeah most of the population yeah. is eating that way it's scary and it's also empowering because if we can change it that in that direction like what you did you reversed it as well so i think that's really key to bring up because you know people might feel like oh no we're doomed right mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean if drew's numbers look like that what are my numbers going to look like mm -hmm. so i think it's important for people to understand that they can also reverse this by making the choices and changing their their lifestyle so i'm kind of curious did you find it harder this time when it came to your physical body to come back to your regular state or was it um easier before it's interesting you know i it, it compared to before so here's the difference in my approach to losing weight back then it was not keto or any kind of fasting it was mostly six small meals a day right high protein maybe moderate amount of carbs you know moderate amount of fat right? Not, not like a keto or intermittent, intermittent fasting style. And yeah, I lost the 75 pounds in six months for sure. But I was 31. It was different. Doing this protocol, losing the amount of weight in four months time, um, for me was remarkable with how, you know, being older, you know, maybe slightly different metabolism, maybe a slightly different hormone panel, but not a huge difference. You know, most 40 year olds probably notice a huge difference from the time they're 30 to 40 for me. I felt like my body did really well because my I know my body's so much better now. And I know keto and intermittent fasting, my body responds really well to that protocol. And being able to lose the fat to where I was able to get back to where I was, 
like I definitely knew that my body responded better to this protocol of eating mostly keto, you know, I would cycle in and out. I would use cyclical, I would use targeted keto, um, and lots of intermittent fasting built into there. My body responded really well to this, this protocol. The only thing that my body, I noticed a difference with was my recovery. Like my recovery just was not the same. Like I definitely had tight lower back and tight hips and from all the working out and, and, you know, the wear and tear on my body, I definitely noticed a difference in that aspect, but my body's ability to respond to the protocol that I prescribed it worked really well in my opinion. And I'm not at all, you know, um, surprised at, at the results. Like I knew I would get back to fit, you know, was it, was it harder in some ways? Sure. Uh, just because I had to be on top of my, you know, my flexibility and stretching and recovery, you know, it was like going to bed early, like at nine 30 every night, like I had to be on top of that stuff. So that's, that's so interesting because in 10 years time too, just the amount of knowledge that you've acquired for yourself, the amount of learning that you've dove into the, even just the trends in, in, you know, fasting really wasn't as much of a thing back then. And you yeah. also taught your body this whole metabolic flexibility in the last number of years as well. So you are kind of coming in with a, a different, I guess, groundwork for, for uh, shifting through. And, and I love that you said that recovery was a huge part of your focus, because I don't think that that's really talked enough about when it comes to even building muscle or, or, you know, even high school athletes. And I don't think it's really the, the whole recovery piece isn't really encouraged as much. And, you know, I, yeah. even going to bed earlier, you know, simple yeah. things like <laughs> that you just know now that you probably just didn't imply. And you said you're doing six small meals a day 10 years ago versus intermittent fasting. I mean, those are, you know, pretty big, big changes, right? Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's just, you know, as you get older, you, you should know your body better and you should be more aware of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to things like fat loss or recovery or sleep or managing your stress. Like my hope is that, you know, as you get older, you do have that level of awareness of knowing your body on a deeper level. And my, and, you know, I think the thing that I've noticed though, is there's people in this group that are following me, they're in their forties and fifties and they still don't have that relationship yet with their body where they, they're just like, Hey, tell me what to eat and tell me what to do versus like, Oh, I know what my body likes and doesn't like, I know my body doesn't like this. It doesn't like that. It likes this and tweaking it from there. A lot of people still don't have that relationship, you know, with their body and really know their body that well. And I think everyone should go on a, some type of self-discovery journey, whatever that looks like for you to really like be in touch and in tune with listening to your body on a deeper level than just jumping on the scale. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah Cause the self-trust isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we're used to having other people tell us what to do and then we follow that and then it doesn't yeah. work because our body is unique and it doesn't, it's not the same as theirs. So then we <clears> go on to the next expert and we try to copy them. So I think that journey of self-discovery is so important. I mean, we speak to a lot of the Ayurvedic doshas and getting people to understand where they fit in those so that they can better understand their metabolism, when they should fast, how they should fast, like all these nuances that are expressed in our bodies, we're not really tuned into because we're not taught to listen to ourselves. We're taught to ask for help. And which I think is the first step and then you really do need to go into that self-discovery. Mm -hmm. As you were speaking, I was, I'm, I'm going to encourage the listeners to go back and listen to your other episode. I don't know if you yeah. remember it, but you were out of breath a lot. <laughs> I do. Today, I do remember that. <laughs> there's a lot of deep inhales. A lot yeah. of deep inhales, but today it's like, oh yeah, there's Drew. He can, yeah, he can talk fine. again. That's so interesting because I, I think I totally took that for granted because I didn't even notice that. But I do remember at my heaviest, I'm like, man. What was it like to not even be aware that I'm breathing heavy? Because I like I don't even feel like I'm I don't even notice my breathing. But back then I was like, <sighs> you know, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, I'm uh, um, I'm curious. You know, you you've got you, you did this after ten years. Is there gonna be a, a, fat, a fit to fat fit fifty? <laughs> <Right. laughs> Are you gonna do it again, or what's what's the plan now for you as you move forward? I don't. Here's the thing. I swore I would never do it again. So I don't want to say I'll never do it because that might yeah. jinx me and then I'll end up doing it. But I don't <laughs> foresee myself doing this again in the future. Yeah. You know, for me, I have to have a really strong why. Like I felt called to do this a second time, to be honest with you, because not a lot of, not a lot of people 
saw the journey as it happened. I think people that saw it this time, it was powerful for them. It was really powerful to see it as it happened versus like, oh yeah, I heard about this guy years ago who did this thing, right? Um, but I don't foresee the need to do it again a third time. Um, so I don't plan on that, but just to not jinx myself, I'm not going to say never because that's what I said last time. <laughs> on, on your, on your road back, did you do, did you implement any longer fasts? Did you do like, did you shrink your meal window more than usual? Like, I'm curious about that side of, of things as well. I kept it to 48 hours, uh, during this, okay. this phase, I did two 48 hour fasts couple 24 hour fast, but nothing ex extreme. I wanted to make sure like this journey was as relatable as possible to people because not everyone's going to go from like never fasting to a seven day fast. Right. Like I didn't, I, and same thing with exercise. Like people are like, Oh, you're probably exercising three times a day. And like, no, I'm a busy single dad and I have a life outside of this, like once a day, five days a week, you know, maybe 40 minutes a day is my workout window and that's it. And same thing with eating. Like when I do eat, it's about 2000 calories a day, which I wouldn't call starvation, but I also wouldn't call extreme, you know, like on the other side of it, like it's, it's a good amount of calories to eat for a male, my size six, one, who's got, you know, some muscle mass. And so it wasn't like I was starving myself or fasting every single day to get back to this weight. Um, I wanted to make it as relatable as possible because, you know, not everyone's going to be able to work out hours a day or, yeah. you know, stretch and meditate for an hour in the morning and then get in cardio in the afternoon and then do weightlifting at night. Like who has time for that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. Yeah, and if you do, I want to know your secret. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Th thanks so much for sharing your journey with mm -hmm. us, Drew. It's, it's always such a pleasure to chat with you and, and I love all the, you know, all the t-shirts you wear. You always, you wear a lot oh. of shirts that say empathy and yeah, I forgot um, to wear it today. Yeah, that's all right. That's right. I mean, but, but really, I mean, you're teaching that to people. You're teaching people about empathy through, you know, that this self-love journey that you're on. So, and I know you, you, you're you starting to release some new things. Um, you know, I think you said maybe even today. Uh, so by the time people listen to this, it's already been launched. But what's, uh, what's, what's next for people? How can they find out more about what you're doing right now? Yeah, well, there's been an overwhelming demand to do this whole back to fit journey, which I've structured into a four month program that you get access to it through my app. Um, so if you go to my website, fit to fit to fit.com, there's so many people still signing up today for this program, because it's the exact program that I use that I prescribe for myself. And I, we kind of tweak it for men and for women. So we kind of break up the meal plan slightly. We have mod modifications for each exercise. So if you work out from home, and you don't have a lot of equipment, we have the movements for you, or if you have access to a gym, we show you how to do it on the app through there. And then this next program is kind of, you know, this whole past four months was focused on fat loss and weight loss. And I think a lot of mistakes people make is they stay in that mode all year round, like dieting, weight loss, calorie deficit all the time. And they don't realize the stress that puts on their body. So this next phase is more of a uh, a, a mass building phase where you're taking a step back from the high intensity stuff. You're taking a step back from the caloric deficit for a, a small period of time. And what I try and tell people, especially the women in the group is like, Hey, take a break for just two months of dieting and losing weight. I promise you this will pay dividends. And it's kind of like an investment. Take these two months, focus on strength, feeding your body some extra calories for uh, uh, just for two months. And I promise you your metabolic rate. And after the, this two month period is going to be so much more efficient and you're going to be able to burn more, more calories after you develop some strength, some lean muscle mass and do this once or twice a year where you're not always in that caloric deficit, always dieting, always trying to lose weight. Because I think this type of phase, everyone needs to go through at least once a year, in my opinion, to build some strength, build some lean muscle mass, increase your metabolic rate. And I promise you, your body's going to thank you for taking a break from just like, you know, I, my body needed a break from dieting and like being in a caloric deficit. It's a lot of stress. And I think a lot of women, especially, you know, don't realize that the type of stress that they put on their bodies by constantly dieting and being in a caloric deficit. Mm -hmm. well, especially their hormones. A lot of women yeah. end up not having their periods anymore or their thyroid kind of freaks out. So I think that's a really important lesson for them to understand that they, they need that variation. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's one of the core things that we teach too with uh, the, um, the Ayurvedic principles. Like there's a seasonal implementation for all these things. And there's, you know, do you, so do you have a favorite time of year, 
you know, where you like to do the mass building or, you know, changing those workout routines, or is it kind of like, Hey, I've been in this for too long. It's let's just hit this now. I kind of listen to my body, but like if I had to pick a time of year, let, I mean, let's be honest, the winter months is a great time totally. <laughs> to, to do that. You know, the summer months, you know, I kind of just planned it because that's kind of what I'm doing now with my back to fit journey. And it ended four months into the year. Uh, but yeah, normally the winter months is a great time to put on some mask, uh, lift heavy, you know, take a break from the high intensity stuff, put on that winter coat a little bit and then, you know, shred down or slim down for summer if that's what you want to do but i think it's good to go through these cycles where you're not just like yeah. constantly women are dieting men are always constantly trying to build muscle it's good to go through cycles so yeah i don't know what you're gonna do in hawaii man there's there's no cold months there. <laughs> more rain yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah at different times of the year yeah. i guess but yeah it's summer all year round so like maybe <laughs> it'll be like to stay in, in, in beach beach uh shape all year round maybe we'll yeah, see there you go. <laughs> that's right yeah so I have a last question for you sure. um, before we sign off. What is one piece of advice you would give your 20 year old self? Just one piece, man, I would write a whole book to myself. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't That's do like this. Stop core. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. The core honestly is to learn how to love yourself. Like, man, I, I was at war with myself my entire life. And I think because of that, I self-sabotage so many times. I think if you go through life hating yourself, at war with yourself, you tend to like beat yourself up. And when you do make a mistake, which you will do as a human, instead of beating yourself up and hating yourself even more, you can learn to develop some empathy for yourself, like have some empathy for you. I'm trying to get empathy across to other people. It starts with you. If you can have empathy for yourself, it's going to be so much easier to have empathy for other people and just like tell my 20 year old self to relax and stop caring so much what other people think about you and develop that empathy. And life will be so much easier because you're not be, you're not at war with yourself. You know, you're you're every single second of the day. So that's kind of what I would I would love tell that. myself. Yeah, I love that answer. It, and and just so everyone's clear, like it's not like we stop the judging. It's just that yeah. we don't listen to it as as loudly, right? And I think yeah, that's definitely. part of the journey too. You know, um, yeah. But that's that's an amazing message for for all of us. Thank you guys. You, if you can go on. back and tell my 20 year old self that too, I would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Your, I think we all should. Yeah. <laughs> we got to figure out a way to go back in time and do that That's and right. fix exactly. this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, Drew. Well, really appreciate the time you took uh, to, to speak with us today. We always learn a ton. Uh, just, you know, you Thank use you that, that self love and empathy. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's a real testament to everything that, that you teach and, and all the people's lives you touch. So thank you so much. Thank you guys. Always a pleasure. Talk to you soon.